I'm definitely against it. I don't even want to discuss the subject with them. I don't think uh, Mount Iron has anything to gain from something like that. Longtime rivals in politics and economic development, the towns of Virginia, Eveleth, Gilbert, and Mountain Iron are not willing to let go of their identities easily. But in a letter received by town mayors today, the Virginia City Council says consolidation is inevitable, and the only way to ensure survival is to form one city government at the core of the plan, saving taxpayers money. We could combine services. We wouldn't have to depend so heavily on state aids for some of our local services, like our, oh, the garbage, the um, fire, mm -hmm. police. Cooperation among the range towns is nothing new. City officials have worked together before on a municipal airport and open enrollment schools. But this proposal calls for a drastic change, one Virginia officials say is needed in the threat of shrinking state aid. The mayor of Mountain Iron disagrees. In the future, they talk about possibly in the future, I'd say in the future there can be less reason to talk consolidation. Mm -hmm. Why is that? Well, because I think we're, our, our development is going to expand to that extent that uh, there will be less reason to talk. Others seem open to the idea but agree consolidation would take time. But it's difficult to do because the range is tight-knit and the people are very close in each community. I think the younger people might think it's okay. I think the older would be more against it. Backers of the consolidation plan know they have a fight on their hands and some of the strongest resistance is expected to come from area politicians. Why? Fewer cities mean fewer mayors, fewer city council members and fewer city officials. In Virginia, Stephanie Guadian, News 6. The task force was appointed by Governor Carlson almost two years ago. To find we are simply trying to find out whether or not the effects of that legislation and other hate crimes reporting uh, has had any effect throughout the state. Is it just that people just aren't accepting uh, the minorities when it comes to sexual preference? Well, I think that's what we, in many cases, we will find. It doesn't face us per se. It, it, it's a task that we're trying to You're almost home. How you holding up? Feeling real well. Real good? Yeah, this is great. Marvelous. I'm feeling real happy. It is an achievement few will ever try. A one-man marathon from St. Paul to Duluth. A grueling 154 miles Ken Foxworth finished at 12.05 this afternoon. <laughs> The 36-year-old UMD counselor received the key to the city, and the day was proclaimed Ken Foxworth Day. He went the distance to raise $150,000 in scholarships for minority and handicapped students to stay in college. He introduced a student who will benefit from the run. Chad is going to graduate not with a BS degree. He's going to graduate with a master's degree. To me, this is why 
this run is necessary. Fox First Run for Excellence commemorates a 40-year-old Supreme Court decision making segregation in public schools illegal. His run is also carrying a very powerful personal message he wants everyone to hear. The longest distance that you have is not 154 miles, it's between both ears. Take heed, because I want to tell you something. Tough times never last, tough people do. Foxworth's trek started one week ago from the Capitol steps in St. Paul. He traveled north on Highway 23, averaging about 24 miles a day. His father, Charles, came from St. Louis to drive the support vehicle. I have three sons, and I asked them to be sure of what they want to do. If they can convince me they are sure of what they want to do, I will be there to help them. The run for excellence has raised $38,000. Foxworth says the battle has just begun. Can you just finish the marathon? What are you going to do next? Disney World! In Duluth, Chip Wallace, News 6. The fire started just east of Iron River and within minutes was raging out of control along Highway 2. Fire crews from six area departments and the DNR responded with heavy equipment and ground crews attempting to contain the blaze. Fire crews' job has been made more difficult by large amounts of downed timber, which caught fire quickly and has spread into a large inferno. Highway 2 was closed because of heavy smoke, but crews were able to keep the fire from jumping the highway. Shortly after 6, the fire was contained and mop-up began. Uh, we're working on burning out the line to make, it, uh, make the fire breaks wider around the fire. Uh, we're patrolling the line to make sure that if, uh, if we have some spot fires outside the line that we catch them right away before they, they grow into another fire. Fire crews expect to stay on the scene through Wednesday. The cause of the fire is under investigation. Near Iron River, Dave Jench, News 6. This is where you come if you're a family to ride by. This is the southern portion of the Munger Recreation Trail, stretching from Hinkley to Barnum. The northern section runs from Carleton to West Duluth, both running through some of the prettiest country in the Northland. By late next summer, the two will be linked, providing bicyclists with 70 miles of paved trail. Unfortunately, it may become one of the state's best kept secrets. We need to provide for the public safety on the trail here. First thing that we did when we got budgets cut was stop printing maps. That map, cut from the budget, was one of the most requested in Minnesota. Enter the Trail Towns Association, a not-for-profit corporation established to promote the trail. Many of its members are business people and officials from nearby towns. We currently have a company working on a map project right now. It's taking advertising. Um, we appreciate any businesses that would like to uh, advertise do so. Each summer, an estimated 100,000 bikers, joggers, rollerbladers, and walkers enjoy the Munger Trail. For the towns and cities along the way, that means a much-needed economic boost. Oh, definitely. You have restaurants for benefit, definitely. You would have uh, any of the stores along the way, convenience stores. Um, people stop if they, want to, if they want to camp overnight. I get a lot of people coming here looking for places to camp. They camp in local campground or state parks. Uh, they basically, um, if they need clothing to go someplace or... There are a lot of different reasons. They'll st stop in town and shop. The number of children living in poverty has doubled in 10 years. Over half first-time marriages end in divorce, and one out of four children are born out of wedlock. These are just a few shocking facts surrounding the children of Minnesota, an issue addressed today in Carleton County. The bottom line to it is our child support system throughout the state of Minnesota is broken and getting worse. Bill Pinsono is the director of Carleton County's Health and Human Services. This morning, he and other county officials announced a countywide attack on child support neglect. The system is so that's for people who want to avoid their responsibilities. Anytime someone out there gets away without paying their child support or taking care of their family, it affects my federal tax, it affects my state tax, it affects my real estate tax. 
Child support cases have increased by 20% in the past four years. Out of that, less than 25% are receiving full custodial support. Last year, Carleton County paid over $2 million in child support. One fourth of that came from the taxpayer. The average taxpayer out here is getting tired of, of paying for people who are always skinning the system. Carleton County's plan is to hold town hall meetings in about two weeks to further discuss the problem at the public level. The first city on their agenda is Cloquet. Remaining virtually the same in that same period of time. We have around five. My comment was, if people are against progress in this community, they probably should get out of town because we're moving ahead. Now, I didn't say if you're against the outlet mall or you, if you disagree with me. What I said was, if you're against progress, you're not going to be happy in this community because we're going to progress, and I think the people showed that last night. picnic area and, and several benches and we're really landscaping with uh, shrubberies and bushes and flowering crabs and we're going to have a fence that matches across with the railroad uh, built. <laughs> There was a slow start. Boxes stuffed with ballots continued to arrive throughout the day. These elections were not computerized, so the millions of hand-marked ballots must also be counted by hand. So each ballot has to cage, carry the stamp of the voting station. And that makes them legitimate. Once the reconciliation has been done, they're counted. The ballot is held up for all the political parties to see, and it's put on a respective pile. Any ballots which are irregular are put to one side and they're counted separately. 900 counting stations are tallying the estimated 23 million ballots and European observers are satisfied with the validity of the election. That the electoral process was adequately transparent and free and fair. The main candidates have all said they will accept the findings of free and fair by the IEC. Zulu King Goodwill Zuelatini implored all South Africans to turn their backs to violence. You have now fought, won the battle, and political freedom. Let us now join hands and fight to win the battles of poverty, disease, and, and ignorance. But at the Catholic Cathedral, this requiem mass reminds the electorate how high the cost of freedom. A week ago, Susan Keene thought her place in history would be in Nelson Mandela's government. Instead, a car bomb, thought to be the work of the white right, has put this 37-year-old candidate in her grave. Kim Hendrew, NBC News. We're past rhetoric, 
passed debate. Now we're writing a health care bill, so I want to be very specific today. I think it's important for students to realize just how much we use reading and writing in our everyday lives. I think sometimes students aren't aware of that. Anything could happen. I slept with one eye open at all times and always looking at the door. There were sexually explicit jokes both in front of male and female uh, staff. By I, whom? I personally heard Mr. Cleaver refer to female clients and female staff as f bitches f and fat asses. Last night, the Duluth School Board decided 6-3 to three to reaffirm its policy not to sell school buildings to private schools. The board then awarded Lakeside School to a private development company for $3,000, rather than accepting a $41,000 bid from St. Michael's, a private school. The board also decided to demolish Cobb and Lowell Elementary Schools at a taxpayer cost of $221,000. That despite bids from private schools for those structures. The board's decision has upset a number of people, including members of United We Stand. The school board acted in its own self-interests, and unfortunately the taxpayers are going to have to pay for those consequences, for the consequences of those decisions, and live with the consequences. Now, unfortunately, there's a consequence that the board will have to suffer, and that will come on Election Day. Also upset today, the staff at St. Michael's. They believe Lakeside would have provided a unique opportunity for their students. Yes, we feel like they will be the losers, and it's unfortunate that the decision was based on um, the, the issues that it was based on rather than on children's needs. According to George Ballich, one of the six supporters of the no-sell policy, if the board were to have sold the structures to private schools, the district would have eventually lost students to those schools and therefore state money, $3,000 per student. St. Michael's officials say they didn't foresee any increase in enrollment. In fact, their school has had an enrollment of about 160 students for the last 70 years. We feel like there's only a certain number of people that are interested in that type of education and that we've pretty much tapped the, the resources here for those students that would be interested in attending our school. The district will demolish Cobb and Lowell sometime next winter. Construction at Lakeside will also begin later this year. In Duluth, Ted Rollins, News 6. I think it's a nice political gesture to have done that. 
But I think the problem they're going to run to it, into is that there are literally millions of guns that are already out there that nobody is, is really dealing with. And I think that's a problem they're going to have in this country. Duluth Police Sergeant Bob Brazell speaks for a number of his fellow officers. Reaction among Northland police to ban certain semi-automatic assault weapons is mixed. And while polls show most Minnesotans favor the ban, gun sales at local shops confirm there are plenty who disagree. It has about uh, quadrupled business just for in the last day and a half, but that's not going to last. Yeah. I've done more business in uh, the last day and a half than I did normally in a month. Gun dealer Paul Bloomington says he doesn't understand the ban, saying many of the earmarked guns are fully automatic machine guns, guns civilians have been prohibited from owning since 1986. But poll after poll has shown public support for stiff bans of the weapons. And although police will say the guns are quickly becoming the weapon of choice of street gangs and drug peddlers, there are those not sure the bill's aim is true. There are so many weapons out and available now that banning their import at this time, it would take years for that to affect the number of weapons available. Uh, and there are so many other weapons that are still available to the public that banning these certain number of assault weapons, I don't think it's going to have an immediate impact on our problems in the, city, in the cities of, the, of this nation. It's great, and usually I'm with my mother on Mother's Day. Last year I was supposed to be with my mother on Mother's Day, but I had just seen her like two weeks previous. So I was here and I was able to play the tournament and win it. I don't do any other kind of gambling. I never put a nickel in the slot machine or at a crap table because I don't like pure chance. This is different. Happy Mother's Day. Get the dealer over the head with Astronomers are preparing, hoping for a spectacular event, if only the weather will cooperate. It is not a total eclipse, but an annular eclipse, when the moon appears smaller than the sun, leaving a ringlet of sunlight peeking through. This all happens because the moon moves between the sun and the earth, casting a shadow on a narrow path of land. The eclipse will first be seen Tuesday morning in Baja, California, traveling across northern Mexico, hitting the U.S. at El Paso. It will cut a 145-mile-wide path going over Amarillo, Tulsa, Toledo, and New England. Oh, oh look, look at that! Look. Oh. There was a total eclipse just three years ago in Hawaii, but the weather did not cooperate, clouds obscuring the eclipse for many who had traveled to the island paradise. However, a few miles away atop the old volcano at Mauna Kea, one of the world's most powerful observatories was above the clouds and got these memorable pictures. It is moving, it is a primal, visceral sort of an experience. The chance for Mother Nature to grab you by the lapels and give you a good shake. For the casually curious to the professional astronomers, an eclipse is a rare treat. But there can also be danger, especially if you try to look directly at the sun, even for an instant even with sunglasses. The sun's rays are so intense, it will damage your eyes. One solution, using a hole in a box works just fine. Put a pinhole in one end, face away from the sun, and watch the eclipse as it is projected against the box wall. Bruce Hall, NBC News. I guess just the uh, and uh, why there isn't a mandate. It bothers me that a two-time murderer could be hired by the city or by the deck, the Irvin, um, that they would be on board. Is compliance, compliance with the adult potential rules as they apply 
apply to that type of facility. When you say audit, are you talking about the audit? Pete Liebeck is taking a business trip to India. Before he does, he goes to Mercy's International Travel Clinic for valuable help, including vaccinations experts say he needs. Uh, any reaction to the vaccines since you were last My time? arms were killing me the last time, but that's, that's about all. Okay. Yeah. The traveler should also be aware of climate and possible interaction with medications for any existing problems like heart disease or diabetes, and protecting yourself against health hazards not common here that may be deadly to you in other countries. And it's important to take precautions not only uh, to be prepared to protect against those illnesses, but also to, to identify the symptoms of those illnesses, which can be potentially devastating. Information and counseling on how to prevent and protect yourself against disease and other health problems are crucial before you take a trip. Here are some more travel tips. Take personal precautions against insects. Put together a traveler's medical kit for your destination, length of trip, and general health. Also ask your doctor about dietary precautions. Don't walk barefoot outdoors except at a poolside or at the beach. Make sure you have a safe and healthy trip. For NBC News, I'm Diana Penna. Hundreds of normally fidgety sixth graders were set free from the classroom this morning to take a cruise on the Vista Star. But this wasn't a pleasure cruise. Today was the beginning of the second annual series of the River Quest Educational Program. A cooperative effort by local businesses, government agencies, and the schools aimed at teaching students about the importance of the harbor and the relationship between commerce and the environment. Like the adults in the area, many sixth graders aren't exactly sure what goes on in the harbor on a daily basis. But they don't have the foggiest idea of uh, things coming and going. So, to clear things up, students went through 11 learning stations during their half day aboard the vessel, learning about everything from shipping to pH levels. What um, is acid and what's a base and what's a neutral and what kind of chemicals go with them. Yeah, they get hands on a lot of things, uh, get to see some different things that they wouldn't normally know anything about. Uh, you know, they know the river's here, they know the ships come in and out, but uh, you know, now they get to know why. Teaching the students at each station are volunteers from businesses and agencies that operate in and around the harbor. We give the idea to the kids that uh, this is an international port as a result of the St. Lawrence Seaway system. And the kids are receptive? You enjoy doing this? Yes, oh yes. It's a, it uh, gives them a, a different perspective about the city in which they live and the harbor in which they see every day. We have to try and uh, get them during their grade years so that they become aware of the importance of the port the maritime commerce and the industry. And the learning on today's cruise wasn't confined to just the students. Oh yeah, now I can put dock a boat uh, you know, properly instead of wrapping the thing all the way around 20 times. <laughs> In Duluth, Ted Rollins News 6. This is a sound you'll be hearing more of in the future. Auto alarms are being installed more frequently as car thefts and burglaries continue in the Northland. And in the first couple of years, it was, oh, maybe one or two systems a month, whereas now it's uh, two to four systems a week. Jay Brink sells and installs auto alarms. The system on this 1992 Lumina is one of the best. It monitors both doors, the trunk, the hood, operates the windows and the locks, and can sense wheel theft. When the vehicle then is uh, jacked up to start to steal the wheels, what will happen is that motion sensor will measure that slow change in how the vehicle is being lifted. And of course, that's going to cause that motion sensor to activate. 
the system that's in this car, what would it cost to, to purchase it and have it installed? As this one sits, it would be about a $600 installed security system. Security experts agree that rolling up the window, locking the door, and taking the keys, these things, they should all be automatic. The police tell us that taking your valuables is just as important. It's amazing. People do leave their wallets, their checkbooks, extra sets of keys, and everything else in their cars. And once those are taken, they're, they leave themselves open for additional thefts through their checks and everything else. So you can't leave anything in your car. They managed to get in with some kind of a wire. There are scrapes along the top of the door. Derek Hines left a portable CB in his car. Even though it was hidden, he's a robbery victim. Tucked away in the glove box, but of course, the glove box wasn't locked and it was an easy, uh, an easy thing to take. People who put expensive stereos and things in their cars, the CBs, they should remove them when they leave their car because people will get in there and they will take them. But I definitely learned my lesson with that CB because uh, uh, the new one that I bought, I take out. During the winter months, people leave their vehicles running so the cars will stay warm. What do you tell them? Once they leave that car running with the keys in it and nobody around, you just leave yourself wide open to a theft. Samoski says anti-theft devices like the club are a good deterrent, but they are defeatable. Once again, the bottom line is lock your car and don't leave anything of value inside. In Duluth, Chip Wallace, News 6. Every two weeks, the city of Duluth pays its one and a half million dollars payroll. This Friday, the money will be paid out only after some fancy financial footwork. The city's general fund is down. The current balance is about $58,000. Most of the revenue that we receive, uh, we receive in the last half of the year. And this year, we were not able to borrow as much as we have normally borrowed in January. This financial bite happens every year at this time, partly because the monies due from the county and state won't be in the city's account until late June. State law allows cities to borrow short term against that expected revenue, but the city charter must first be changed. Dorothy Bowman last night blocked that action. What happens if at the end of every year when they got to pay these bonds back, uh, they don't get the amount of money into the treasury from the state and from the city that they assume they would. If the general fund is low, how city employees will get paid is the question on everyone's mind. The city has a number of funds. The general fund is only one of those funds, and that's the fund used for operations. We will borrow money from one of the other funds that has, has money in it. Meanwhile, Councillor Bowman says she's going to ask the state auditor's office why the state changed the tax levy definition. In Duluth, Chip Wallace, News 6. And then they get a lot of their state money in December. And Well, the boundary doesn't uh, show a, a big difference uh, to the trees and to the wildlife and to the fisheries and to the waters and to the lands and to the, the movement of air pollutants, etc. So we think it's important for the two jurisdictions, uh, both in Canada and the U.S., to get together to work on uh, ecosystem management. But boundaries do separate one part of the ecosystem, fish. Anglers and resort owners along the U.S.-Canadian border continue to deal with new regulations placed on them from both sides of the fence. However, officials in Ontario say they have good reason for the Canadian restrictions on fishing. Certainly our resort operators need to have an uh, uh, opportunity to make, make money. The resource has to come first though, and, and if, their, if their continued level of fishing uh, uh, is sustained, then the, the, the resource won't be sustained and there won't be any, any tourists anymore. So. can dwell for a long time on trying to lay blame or we can work towards solutions. And the whole intent of this particular session was perhaps to put some of the old baggage behind us and start proceeding on, on, a, on a more appropriate path for management within the region. The mill 
We have TV at Window to America. We see you. You don't see us. I watch the news every night. Whenever they show Indians, it's always that same tired tub of walleye. Maybe some kind of bingo doings. <laughs> Ten years ago, when Native Americans began exercising their treaty rights, these were the sights and sounds broadcast on local television. Today, the treaty rights battle has moved from the boat landings to the state capitals. The prize has expanded to include gaming revenue and lots of it. The National Indian Gaming Association estimates the revenue from Indian casinos in 27 states hit $4 billion last year. An example is Black Bear Casino near Carleton, with half a million dollars a month in supplies purchased from local community businesses. Its payroll is nearing $1 million a month. We've become an economic part of the greater community. It would be harder today for the community to have us go back to nothing. The prize has created more than a little economic envy and an active effort by state lawmakers to cash in. If people read this, they're going to be kind of mad. I mean, they, this is a lot of money that is right in the state of Minnesota and we can't get it for anything. Can't get it for compulsive gambling. We can't get it for uh, the general fund. Senator Joe Bertram is referring to reports about casino profit payouts at Minnesota's Mystic Lake Reservation, which just gave each of its members $400,000. We've been treated, you know, pretty terrible, you know, throughout the year, so it was time to take care of our people. The Mystic Lake what... story is sensational but uncommon. Most reservations are using casino profits for education, health care, and to create jobs for people like Doris Smith. I could do things with my family that I wasn't able to do before. I was on AFDC before, which can take a lot from a person. You know, whether it's a single mother or a single father, it takes away a lot, you know, personally. Yet Doris and others like her with solid jobs and growing futures still face a stereotype of a people on the dole. Prejudice comes in so many different little subtle ways. And prejudice sometimes is fear, and it's a whole bunch of other things. It's ignorance, it's fear, uh, it's economic anger. And, but uh, I used to think that education would cut down on prejudice. It doesn't. Now, all it makes is for is an educated bigot. As Native Americans create jobs and profits, they're also creating a power base that reaches all the way to the Rose Garden in Washington, D.C. Recently, the president offered two executive orders protecting treaty rights and the newfound power of the nation's Native Americans. For some, this shift of power is threatening. The total welfare of the Native American in the state has changed, and I think there, there's a lot of fear about that, what will happen, um, uh, you know. And whether or not that's fair, I'll leave to somebody else. I don't know. That's I think the issue is it's viewed as not being fair. Bias whites. Bias whites. Probably because of my coloring, I don't get it so much. Mm -hmm. And uh, but because of uh, my job and uh, the people that know me in the area, uh, there are it happens. Other white people refuse to meet my eye, look away, and ignore me as if I'm not there. Most Native Americans living in the Northland can tell you personal stories of prejudice they've faced. And just as often, white people will tell you racism isn't a problem here. In fact, in a survey we commissioned, a clear majority of Northlanders said there was not a strong cultural bias against Native Americans in this area. So we decided to conduct a little experiment to determine which point of view was more accurate. <laughs> Using two similar cars, we asked two pairs of volunteers to spend time stranded on Highway 53 during afternoon rush hour. Our first volunteers were Native American women. Their car displayed reservation license plates. In 45 minutes, only three cars stopped to assist them. That's one stop every 15 minutes. And two of those stops were made by Native Americans. We tried the experiment again. We used a similar car, but this time our women in distress were white. Their car bore Minnesota license plates. 
In 45 minutes, 18 Good Samaritans stopped to help, better than one stop every three minutes. The results, once again, help was offered to the white women six times as often as to the Native American women. We took our findings to an expert, psychiatrist Clyde Olson. We asked if this was proof of prejudice in the Northland. I think that's one of those subtle findings. I think, and I think it's it's there. What about the victims of prejudice? Make we asked one of our Native American volunteers how she ever. felt when stranded. Very unimportant. Uh, I felt I wasn't even worthy of someone to stop to assist me. Did the results surprise you at all in the survey? No. No, I was expecting something like that. Um, I, I guess a lot of us that live around here are at the point now that we just kind of blow it off. It happens on such a daily basis. Experts readily admit we all prejudge. They also say when the dominant culture unleashes prejudice, it can rob the victim of self-esteem. People tend to, with low self-esteem and poor, poor self-image, they tend not to be self-actualized, they tend not to be adequately educated, adequately careered. Uh, they don't do things that are positive and self-assertive uh, in their lives. It's just about any time I leave my family or the little town I live in, I encounter racism. Except for boarding school as a child and a stint in Vietnam, award-winning author and poet Jim Northrup hasn't strayed far from his family home on the Fond du Lac Reservation. There is no mistaking that Jim is a Native American. You might be surprised, however, to discover Bruce McLeod, the new Western Collegiate Hockey Association commissioner, is also a member of the Lake Superior Band of Ojibwe. I am Native American, and I'm proud of that. An Ojibwe raised on an Indian reservation in Ontario, Bruce's father was forced to make a tough decision after returning home from World War II. At that time in Canada, there was a lot of things uh, Indian people could not do. They still could not vote, couldn't go into certain places. Uh, uh, so there's a lot of things couldn't own land off the reservation, a lot of things like that. So dad made a decision to give up all of his rights and, and move off of the reservation. Bruce's father got a job in a mill and moved to Fort Francis where he raised his family. When we were young, I remember packing up in the truck, all of us, and he would take us off on Saturdays and weekends to visit his friends on the reservations, and, and we'd go to powwows and different ceremonies and stuff like that. So when Bruce was learning about his father's life on the reservation, Jim was experiencing life off of his reservation in a federal boarding school for Indian children. A first grader, a federal boarding school, Pipestone, said Anin to the first grown-up, got an icy blue-eyed stare in return, got a beating from a second grader for crying about the stare, couldn't tell Ma or Dad, both were 300 miles away. While Bruce escaped that painful childhood experience, his middle-class upbringing in Fort Francis didn't spare him the pain of prejudice. He felt that firsthand as a young hockey player. And they were sometimes, you know, quite outspoken about it, but they were usually people that didn't know me. I was in another town and they'd be yelling things from the stands, you know, that were quite racist. In the Native American culture, the wisdom of the elders is honored, a fact that is underscored by these men. We thank money due for fish, for life, as we praise our grandfathers and their generational wisdom. Generational wisdom for Bruce was his father's work ethic. Yeah, where he kept all his tools and all that. He was a millwright in the mill and uh, he had a little sign up there. And I never thought about it when I was growing up, but uh, thought about it after a lot, And uh, but because it, it kind of reflected the way he, he saw things, that little sign, it said, uh, once a job has begun, be it big or be it small, do it well or not at all. A faded photograph hangs on Jim's living room wall, a treasured picture of the grandfather that taught him tolerance in the old ways of the Anishinaabe, lessons Jim is now passing along to his son. I think it's important for him to learn both worlds because he's got to exist in the white world but I also think it's very important for him to learn the seasonal activities of the Anishinaabe because that's what keeps us humble that's what keeps us connected
Heartland schools are holding multicultural days to educate our children. Colleges offer courses in Indian studies to educate adults. Unique partnerships and communications are being formed. Our main mission is to build a bridge of understanding uh, between the Native and non-Native communities. Community radio station WOJB near Hayward is owned by the Lacouture Reservation. A lot of people who haven't heard WOJB, you know, you tell them that we're a tribal radio station right away. They think, oh, okay, you guys just play Indian music, the drum music. And when I explain to them that, no, we carry national public radio news, we also carry American public radio programs, we carry Canadian Broadcasting Corporation, as it happens, and Pacifica News, and right away their eyes light up. Wow. The station also carries programming that focuses on Native American culture. Sarah Risa Begay hosts a weekly radio program called Drum Song. For WOJB listeners, it's a night of entertainment and information on the lives of contemporary Indians. We're just like everyone else, except we can go back to our traditions. We can go back to how it used to be a long time ago, and then we can also come to the modern world and be like everyone else and go to McDonald's and we can be in a ceremony that night. Equal rights! Equal rights! WOJB and its small army of native and non-native volunteers worked round the clock during the height of northern Wisconsin's spearfishing protests. Protests and in other areas of Wisconsin were rife with racial undertones. <laughs> We had reporters regularly on the boat landings. We held uh, forums here at this very table involving the most, uh, most outspoken and in some cases uh, the leaders of the, of the opposition to treaty rights along with tribal members and clergy people right around this table on an extended live broadcast. What we did is we provided ah. that information to them to let them decide for themselves who was right and who is wrong. The radio station is one small piece of a large puzzle designed to break down cultural barriers. Other efforts include the reservation's junior college which claims native and non-native students and its casino which has become an important employer and economic force in the Hayward area. The bottom line is that the communication and dialogue is is really the cornerstone of resolving differences rather than going through editorials and writing nasty letters to, to you know I think that when people can sit down and roll up their sleeves and, and then agree to disagree, and now let's, let's look for a common ground and solution, um, that's, that's, that's really the biggest step you can take. Feel anything, Bob, uh -huh. right there? Is that uncomfortable at all? No. Okay. The days of Novocaine are all but over for a routine trip to the dentist. Replacing the painful shot in the mouth is a new system of electronic anesthesia. There really is no waiting. You know, you put it on like you felt. You put it on, you turn it on, and it's providing anesthetic or anesthesia right away. Whereas with Novocaine, it's, you know, use a topical, inject the solution, wait 5 to 15 minutes. So. The system works as follows. Two pads are placed on the patient's face. An electric current is sent through the pads, stimulating the nerves. That stimulation effectively keeps the area nerves busy, which blocks out pain signals that would be headed for the brain. Electronic anesthesia has been used for years in numerous medical procedures, but is just now becoming the anesthetic of choice for most dentists and for most patients as well. Tell me about it, what'd you think? Oh, hey, it's better than the needle. Another benefit of the system is that when the unit is turned off, the effects of the anesthesia are gone, unlike Novocaine. The system also leaves the amount of electronic stimulation up to the patient. This handheld unit is equipped with a dial that can be turned up if the pain increases. The biggest fear of dentistry is getting anesthetic, getting a needle, you know. And that's what it boils down to. So it is a great alternative for that, but it's not going to replace anesthesia totally. But if you can do it and get by with it, and it's going to work out, it's a lot nicer. In Duluth, Ted Rollins, News 6. Well, thank you. You're welcome. Thank you, Bob. Thanks, Bob. I
appreciate it. Is that it, no? But the only change that we have have seen right now is that Haitian people who, who their lives are in danger in Haiti and are trying to get in, in our country and they are asked for asylum, still they are, their boats are stopped and their boats are sunk. The only difference right now is that now they are asked, so why are you coming to USA? So that's seatbelt on and very evident so we we've got our first what we find with the seat belts is that in the outstate area like this we don't use them as much as they would in the metro area uh, safety they figure the safety factor up here uh, a little less traffic Twenty-four people, including 11 children, drowned last year in Minnesota lakes and rivers. According to the Department of Natural Resources, most of these drownings happened in less than 20 feet of water and could have been prevented with some knowledge of water safety. Drownings are the third leading cause of unintentional injury death among persons of all ages in the United States. In toddlers ages one and two years, they're the single leading cause of injury death. According to a study of the American Medical Association, drownings among toddlers have increased 23 percent in the last 10 years. Even though most accidents happen in the family or a neighbor's pool, don't count out a tragedy going to the beach in the summer months. Parents need to supervise their children at all times, every second that they're in the bathtub, around a pool, around a bucket of water, and it's not adequate to leave the child in the care of an older sibling. Most accidents happen when children are left unsupervised near a pool, and sometimes at the beach where there aren't lifeguards. And while lifeguards do provide some degree of safety, supervision is the most important factor. Most people would consider it immoral for a child not to be in a car seat, but unfortunately we're only too happy to leave our swimming pools unprotected. Another way to protect your child is to surround the pool with a fence and a gate that latches to prevent entry. In Duluth, Barbara Riles, News 6. Parents need to supervise their children.
overall, I, I wanted to talk to the people about the can-do attitude that we have in Wisconsin, the fact that we've improved the economy, we've taken more people off of welfare, protected the environment, created a great educational system, in my vision, and how we can continue to build upon that strong foundation and make it even stronger and better for tomorrow than it is today. worked very hard and I think as much as anything that when I've talked with people I've just tried to talk straight with them. Ann Winnie's straight talk has paid off so far. She's the favorite to win the DFL party endorsement tonight for a seat in the U.S. Senate. But Winnie and other lesser known candidates know the road to victory at the September primary will be a rough one. Polls show Minnesota DFLers don't prefer any of the candidates at this point. Seasoned politicians say it's too early in the game to make any calls. I wasn't well known when I started out. It's not a question of you're standing in the polls at the beginning when people don't know you. It's whether or not uh, the people running have character, whether people in Duluth and Northeast Minnesota will believe in people. And I think we've got some excellent candidates, so I, I really feel good about it. Still, publicity is the name of the game at this point, and many of the convention's 2,000-plus partygoers made sure their candidate's name was clearly visible to media and delegates. The DFL convention may look like a lot of fun, but it's serious business, and for many candidates fighting against anonymity, banners, signs, and party hats are key ingredients for recognition, recognition needed to win an election. Insiders say a commitment from all candidates to ensure a win for the DFL party first may be what the group needs to regain control of Minnesota's top political seats. All too often, Democrats have been fighting each other right to the nth degree, and even at, uh, at party conventions, many times it's been a kind of a situation where, where people are so close to each other that it, in, in terms of anger, that it takes many weeks, months to get over that. I don't think we're at that stage. I think we're going to be able to move right off the dime here right after this uh, convention and get working right away. In St. Paul, Stephanie Guadian, News 6. I believe the train ignited it, but I don't know the size. We got the call uh, shortly after noon, and uh, when we got here, the DNR was on the scene already. Town of Parkland arrived shortly after that time. Amperville. We hit Amperville and we cleaned that town out and there we had a lot of casualties. House to house fighting. And I think we were all scared, and of course, it was an unknown situation. And like I say, we left on the 4th of June, and uh, then we were well out to sea when we got the order to uh, stop the invasion at that point. Well, then we just stayed out at sea until we got orders to go on in on the 6th. And uh, during this time, the uh, skipper of our ship showed us the um, where we were going to land so when we did finally land why it was familiar to us because we could recognize a lot of the things in the pictures and uh, we were told at that time that we could expect all the way from 60 to 80 percent casualties but fortunately utah beach uh, wasn't that bad Uh, I'd say the 
test samples that are no good after they've been thrown. Title. Yeah. <laughs> well, as it spun, it would arm the bottom. So then it hits the ground and pulls out. So that's, I've got a better breakdown of it, but that's that. I don't know. But we got word that it has been ratified from, by them as well. So we do have a, a teacher's contract in place through the end of 95. Grandma's Marathon, can I help you? Welcome to Command Central, the think tank behind Grandma's Marathon. While the office is open year round, the week before the race is run at a feverish pace. Doug Curtis is number one. He's last Besides last-minute preparations for what has become the nation's seventh largest marathon, organizers have been busy battling Mother Nature. A storm earlier this week took its toll. Our medical tent had some damage to it, and just the, the high winds obviously weren't good for the tents. Um, think things will be under control, and, and hopefully we won't have that kind of wind coming through on uh, the weekend. Workers are repairing the damage and building what will become a city of its own. Local businesses are also preparing for the onslaught of thousands of people to the Northland. The 18th annual Grandma's Marathon is big business. Runners and spectators should top 200,000 and bring more than $5 million into the community. This is a time that every hotel in Duluth could sell their hotel rooms five times over. It's a huge weekend for Duluth. And getting bigger, a fast course, cool weather, and good race management keep Grandma's Marathon running strong. In Duluth, Stephanie Guadian, News 6. I'm just going to deal with it one day at a time. That's all I can do. Everything is gone. Box after box. You have accumulated for 30 years, you know. It's all gone.